All right. Um, good evening, everybody. This is part 24 of our series on the first chapter of Sanhedrin. Um, I am sharing my screen, but if at some point in the future you want a copy of this document or you just want to ask me a question, I'm Deborah Clapper at gmail.com. If you're in the share and you want to be added to the mailing list, um, you can also send me an email and I will do so. Um, but everybody I see here is already on it. Okay, so we have been for several weeks now dealing with the question of when and for what reason um, you can create a leap year by adding a, an extra month of Adar. Just reminding that if that our months are decided based on the cycle of the moon, um, but the cycle of the moon is 29 and a half days and 12 moon cycles is 354 days and 354 days is 11 days less than the time it takes the earth to go around the sun, which is 365 and a quarter days. Uh, and so on average, seven out of every 19 years, we add an extra month, which we're in right now, Adar Aleph. Okay. So here we are, we're, we're in this series of Breitot, from, mostly from the Tosefta, giving details about uh, the circumstances in which we do or don't um, add this extra month. And the language of the Mishnah, the Tosefta, the Gemara, all of the above, uh, is to call this practice of adding an extra month to the year, impregnating the year. So that's what the language we'll be using. Tanu Rabbanan. So the brightness says we don't um, impregnate the year either from one year to the next, which Rashi says means impregnating this year because next year it will be necessary. And you can't do three years in a row, even presumably if the weather is freakishly weird and we otherwise fulfill all of the requirements for having a leap year in a particular year. If the previous two years were both leap years, you still can't make a leap year, even if it's freakishly cold and the barley's not gonna be ready and so on, because otherwise it eventually Pesach will end up in the middle of the summer if we push it too far. Amar Bishimon. Rabbi Shimon says, well, that's nice, but we have a story that Rabbi Akiva himself, when he was in jail, he declared three consecutive leap years. Um, now, you may remember that Rabbi Akiva dies a horrible death. He's uh, torn to pieces by iron combs at the order of the uh, Roman executioner. And this seems to have been in his final imprisonment when he's been sentenced to death, but not yet executed. Um, and Rabbi Shimon claims he declared three leap years while he was in jail. So that sounds like you can do three years, one right after the other. Amrulo, so they said to Rabbi Shimon, Misham Raya, they said, you think that's a proof? Beitin yashvu v'kavu achat achat bizmana. He didn't really declare three leap years and they weren't consecutive. What he did was he gave instructions. Oh, I am very sorry that is supposed to be turned off. Um, he gave instructions for when the leap years were supposed to be. And then a court sat and properly declared the leap years using his astronomical calculations. Um, but all he did was sit there in his jail cell and use his expertise, which was about to disappear because he was about to be killed to do the calculations for the next three necessary leap years. So it doesn't prove anything about the court sitting and declaring more than one leap year at a time, nor does it prove anything about consecutive leap years. Uh, nor, I suppose, about a single person declaring leap years by themselves, but it, it doesn't sound like Rabbi Shimon was trying to claim that. Okay, Tana Rabbanam, our next bright. Ein ma'abriyant ha-shana lo b'shvi'it v'lo b'motz'eshvi'it. Right, it says you can't make a leap year either in Shemitah, which the uh, Mishnah and the Brita tend to call Shvi'it, nor in the year after Shvi'it, in the year after Shemitah. 
Now you may remember that last week, if you were here, the we had a Brita that said that you can't make a uh, leap year in the a year when there's a food shortage or in the year after the year in which there's a food shortage. And this seems to just be a special case of that principle that we assume that if you're not allowed to farm, there's not going to be enough food. And so you don't want that year to last an extra month because that's an extra month in which you can't grow food. Okay, that's that's why you don't make the Shemitah year um, a leap year. And you don't make the year after a leap year because you want to get to the harvest and to being permitted to eat the harvest. Because remember, you can't eat the new grain until after the second day of Pesach. So you want to get to permission to eat the new harvest as quickly as possible because you have run out of food. Okay. So in that case, that's two years in a row when you can't make a uh, can't make a leap year. So in that case, when did they usually make a leap year? Erev Shvit. They usually made a leap year the year before Shemitah. Um, and Rashi is very careful to note here that the reason they made a leap year the year before Shemitah is because you need you want to have an extra month in which you can farm before you stop being able to farm um not because it'll be astronomically and agriculturally appropriate to have a leap year next year but we won't be able to do it because that would violate our principle from further up the page where we said you can't make a leap year this year because it will be appropriate next year so it has to be that there's something about about Erev Shvid, about the year before Shemitah, that itself makes it a good idea to always have a leap year then. And the answer to that, Rashi says, is because it's a, um, because you want an extra month in which to farm. I would like to note that at this very moment, we are in both a leap year and Shemitah. This principle is not currently operative. Uh, possibly, although I don't know for sure, because the at the time the calculations were done that created our present leap year cycle, there was basically no Jewish farming in the land of Israel. There was then for the next 1500 years, no Jewish farming in the land of Israel. And we are now, I, my guess would be operating in a world that those people, the people who did the original calculations would not really have wanted this to happen, but they couldn't imagine it happening uh, without there also being a Sanhedrin that could fix the situation. And so I, I I don't think we're here on purpose. I think it just sort of happened. Um, okay. So, um, but it turns out that this is not a consensus. Shall be Rabban Gamliel hayu ma'abrim But the, the from the house of Rabban Gamliel, they would in fact make a leap year the year after Shemitah, um, unlike the position that was just noted in this bracha. And they're disagreeing about the following dispute, which doesn't, on the face of it, appear relevant. The Brayta teaches we don't bring vegetables from outside the land of Israel into the land of Israel, but the rabbis permitted it. Now, we'll get to why that might be in just a second, but first let's see how it's connected to the situation with Shemitah, sorry, the year after Shemitah, and uh, leap year, if you're willing to import food during Shemitah and the year after Shemitah, then the urgency of getting the uh, produce of the land of Israel permitted to people to eat is a much less because you don't have as much of a food shortage. Um, so if, you're, if, if you say you can import vegetables into the land of Israel, then you can just import vegetables for an extra month. It doesn't matter that much if you don't get to your local harvest sooner, supposing you have the money, but it sounds like that was not an issue. Um, and the uh, position that holds that you're not allowed to import food, those people are going to assume that you're super desperate for food by the end of Shemitah and the year after until you can harvest something. All right, but so why do we have a position that says you can't import vegetables into the land of Israel? Why specifically vegetables? Well, the Gemara asked that my Benai, who what are they really arguing about? I'm a Rabbi Yirmiya, Choshishen Legushehen Ike Benai. So Rabbi Yirmiya says the thing they're really arguing about is whether you worry about the clods of dirt that are stuck to the roots of the vegetable. Because the thing is that there's a there's tuma that inheres rabbinically in dirt from outside the land of Israel. Um, 
if you want an explanation of the reason why you would make such a rabbinic decree, it would be to make people not want to leave the land of Israel. Um, but the reason the uh, mecha the mechanical reason that was used in order to make the decree presumably was that we're not in charge there and we have no way of knowing where there might be dead bodies. Um, but I, I think the, the, the inspiration for making this decree would be that you would like to discourage people from, from leaving the country. That clearly didn't work, um, but still. Uh, in any case, so if you then take chunks of dirt from, I don't know where, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt, and carry those chunks of dirt into the land of Israel, uh, even into parts of Israel where people are, you know, living a life of tahara to, in order to be able to go into the Beit HaMikdash and to be able to use their things in the Beit HaMikdash, to use their dishes with sacrifices and things like that. So it's very important that we keep Tameh things, especially Tameh things that don't look Tameh, away from those people because then they will, by mistake, get that dirt onto their stuff and now their stuff is Tameh and they don't know about it. So that would be the reason why you would want to keep this dirt out of the land of Israel. It is not clear to me whether the position that says that it's permissible to import the vegetables thinks that people will wash the vegetables or for some other reason, thinks that the dirt is going to come in, but isn't going to be a problem. I, I'm, I'm, not I'm not clear on exactly what the mechanism is of the not worrying about it. But one way or the other, the position that doesn't worry about it is going to connect with the position that is willing to make a leap year right after Shemitah because they're not as desperate for food. Okay, next bright. And this is going to be the one where we're going to spend most of the rest of our evening. Tana Rabbanon. Yeah. Is that not... That sounds like they're talking specifically about root vegetables. Well, or any vegetable where you would take the whole plant with you to market. Yeah, but like, like, what about you know? Uh, I mean, the, the main concern in terms of uh, shemitah, I would think, would be in those days would be grain. Yeah, and so I don't think this is going to be affected. I, the, the everyone is going to allow you to import grain, um, but. That's not going to be. I, I think that it's it's not going to be enough, and it's going to be very expensive. So you also want to be able to import your other vegetables, and even something like a watermelon or a gourd or something like that. A cucumber is going to have dirt on it because those things are sitting on the dirt before they're harvested. My watermelons at least if I get them in a farmer's market or something, routinely have dirt on them. It's not as much of an issue with fruit because that tends to hang higher up above the ground. But the vegetables are often sitting on the ground when they're, when, when they're growing. In any case, it, you're right that the main problem ought to be grain. And I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. Okay. Um, so our next issue, though, is tuma. So the Brayta says we don't make a leap year because of tuma, and it seems like the issue here should be that there is some kind of tuma problem that's going to prevent people from celebrating Pesach. Now, and you need extra time to get rid of it. There's a problem with that, which is that most, almost all kinds of tuma can be gotten rid of in eight days or less. And the last day that you can declare a leap year is the 29th day of Adar, which is more than two weeks before Pesach. So it's a little hard to know how you could predict that tuma would be a problem. Um, somebody, I think it was Rashi, suggested that if it's if the king is gravely ill and he's expected to die in about a week and a half and you anticipate that everybody will have to go to a funeral in a week and a half and then no one will be able to do Pesach. Um, maybe that it, it, we're going to see a real case in Tanakh and it doesn't sound like that's what's happening there. Um, and in fact, the 
Tosvot kind of looks at the case in Tanakh and says, I, I don't know why they couldn't just make everybody Tahor. And he just kind of shrugs his shoulders. And I don't have anything better than that to offer, but let's let's read it at face value. And the, the, there's, there's clearly a, a factor missing that, that we don't quite understand. Okay. In any case, the first position in the Brighta said, you can't make the year a leaf year because of Tuma. Rabbi Yehuda said, Ma'abri. Rabbi Yehuda says, no, we, we, we do. That's a legitimate reason to, to add a month. Um, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda says, So Rabbi Yehuda says it happened that Chizkiah, the king of Yehuda, added a month to the year because of Tuma, and then he prayed for himself. Now, let's take a look at this inside. We're in the 30th chapter of Bet Chronicles 2. And it's pretty weird. I don't know exactly what's going on here, but it's entirely possible that Hezekiah has declared a leap month because of Tuma, but I, I, I admit that I don't fully understand what's going on here. So starting from the beginning of chapter 30, it says, <laughs> So Chizkiah sent um, letters to um, all of Yisrael and Yehuda and Ephraim and Menashe to come to the house of Hashem in Yerushalayim to do Pesach for Hashem. And the um, and the king and, and his his uh, ministers and all of, all of the community got together in Jerusalem in order to do Pesach in the second month. Now, generally speaking, Nisan in Tanakh is the first month, so they are here in the second month, which is the wrong month. Kilo um, yachlula asoto beetahi. Yeah, because they couldn't do um, Pesach in the correct time. Um, they couldn't do it in the right time because the Kohanim were, hadn't sanctified themselves, which might mean they weren't Tahor. Heard to say that the words do sometimes get used back and forth like that. And the people weren't gathered to Yerushalayim. So the um, the thing was proper in the eyes of the king and the community. And so the they established the thing to send out a message to all of Yisrael from Beersheba to Dan to come to do Pesach to Hashem, but not the way that it's written. And they send out messages and they, they do it. And then we get in to eventually to verse 18, which is uh, Rabbi Yehuda is about to quote, in which uh, Chizkiah prays for mercy because he thinks he's done the wrong thing. So they, they celebrate Pesach in the a month later than they were supposed to. Now there are a number of ways that could happen. It could be that they declared a leap month. And when it says the second month, they don't really mean the second month, they mean the month that would have been the second month, but now it's really the first month. Or it could mean they tried to make a leap year and failed and made Pesach in the month that they thought was Nissan, but really it's ER. Or it could mean they didn't make a leap month. They just decided not to do Pesach on its regular date and to celebrate at Pesach Sheni instead. And we're going to see all three of those options in the Gemara as we continue. Um, okay, but back in Rabbi Yehuda's voice here. Dichtiv ki marbit ha'am rabat me'afrayim u'menashe yisacharu zbulun lo hetiteharu ki achlu et ha'pesach v'lo kakatu Okay, now this, this pasuk reads a little bit like it was um, 
cut up into little pieces and reassembled strangely. And that may uh, sound that way in the translation that I wrote, but that's not my fault. <laughs> the pasuk sounds that way. Um, so, so the pasuk says, it, because many of the people uh, from Ephraim and from uh, the, the many from Ephraim and from Menashe and Yisachar and Zvulun at, were, had not become Tahor be, at, because they ate the Pesach not like it is written. Because Chizkiah prayed about them saying, Hashem, the good, the great, I don't know, will um, atone for. And I added a them because that felt wrong, but it doesn't actually even say for them. It just says for and ends abruptly. In any case, something was wrong about how they did Pesach and Chizkiah prayed for mercy because he thought he'd done the, run, the wrong thing. That, that's pretty clear. But now we need to figure out what it is that went wrong here. But we're not quite done with the Brita yet. Rabbi Shimon Omer, So the first position said, you can't make a leap month because of Tuma. Second position said, you can make a leap month because of Tuma. And now Rabbi Shimon seems to be taking a middle position. You can't do it, but if you did it, then it worked. I mean, you shouldn't do it, but if you did it, then it worked. So now in Rabbi Shimon's universe, in which it does work, uh, if you declare a leap month. So we're asking, wh why does he think that Chizkiah was upset and prayed? So working backwards, that means we must think that to begin with, we thought that the reason he was praying was because he thought his making of a leap month didn't work. Uh, he made a leap month because they were all Tamei. And then they thought it was Adar again, and they waited until they thought it was Nissan to make Pesach, but in fact, they were wrong. And so when they were making Pesach, it was really ER, and they were celebrating Pesach in the wrong month. And when he realized that, he said, Oy vey, and he prayed for mercy. That's what we, seems to have been our first interpretation. Now, our second interpretation, Rabbi Shimon says, She'en ma'abriyan ela Adar v'hu iber Nisan v'nisan. So... Shimon says, in fact, if he had made the year a leap year because of the Tuma, that would have been fine. But that's not what happened. What happened is that he waited too long and it was already Nissan. And he said, you know what? We're going to have two Nissans this year. This is Nissan Aleph, which is fake. Next month will be Nissan Bet, which will be the real Nissan. And that doesn't work. So once he realized that that had not worked, then he went back and uh, and did tshuva and prayed. Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda, Mar Mishum Rabbi Shimon, Mipnei Shehi Siyat Yisrael Lasot Pesach Shein. So Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda suggests a different reason why he would be upset. He said, you know what, maybe Chizkiah didn't declare a leap year at all. Maybe he just told everybody, you know what, guys, go home come back in a month. There's this thing called Pesach Sheni. We'll make, you, you'll come back and do Pesach at Pesach Sheni when you're all Tahor. And then after he did that, he realized that had been the wrong decision. He was upset. He did Chupa. He prayed for mercy. And we'll, we'll hear more later about maybe why that could have been the wrong decision. We'll come back to it. First, we have to deal with, with uh, uh, Rabbi Yehuda, who has two different um, self-contradictions we need to deal with, which I kind of glossed over one of them a minute ago, but we'll come back to it. So, Amar, so you, the, you, the Gemara, just said, Rabbi Yehuda Omer Ma'abri, you just said that Rabbi Yehuda thinks you can, in fact, impregnate the year because of Tuba. Alma, eat Leila Rabbi Yehuda, Tuma Dechuya Hibetzibor. So it must be, that Rabbi Yehuda thinks Tuma Duchuya Hibitzibor. Now we need a little background here. Everybody agrees that in the event that you have no choice and everybody available is tummy, public sacrifices can be offered in a state of Tuma. And everybody agrees that that is also true of the Korban Pesach. If the majority of the people obligated to bring a Korban Pesach are Tamei mate at the time of Pesach. That the people who are Tamei mate, and it has to be Tuma mate, but we're glossing over that in this Gemara, we, we aren't actually addressing different kinds of Tuma, but 
back in Pesachim, we learned that it had to be to my mate. If the majority of the obligated people are Tame, then you bring the Pesach anyway, um, even in a state of Tuma. Now, inside that situation, there is a dispute about why. Either you can say Tuma Dehuya Bitsibur, which is the thing that Rabbi Yehuda is being accused of believing here, which means Tuma is pushed aside by the, by the public. Which would mean that we really do care about Tuma. This is really very bad, but you don't have a choice. And sometimes you have to choose the lesser of two. It's a lesser of two evils argument. Right? The, the, the Tuma is still there. It's just sort of being pushed out of the way. Or the other option is Tuma Hutra Bitsibur. Tuma is permitted by the public. And that would mean once everybody's tummy, we just don't care anymore. And in that case, it's not a lesser of two evils. It's a, this is just what you're supposed to do. So there's no reason to try to avoid it. It's fine. So if Rabbi Yehuda thinks that it would be a good reason to create it a leap year just to avoid having a situation where most people are tame at Pesach, it must be that he thinks that it's very much not ideal to have a situation in which you're going to do the Pesach in a state of Tuma. And that we call that position Tuma Dechuya Bitsibur, right? That's the position I just called the lesser of two evils position, right? It's Tuma is bad and you shouldn't be doing sacrifices in a state of Tuma, but you don't have a choice to do it just this once. That's Tuma Dechuya Bitsibur. And if you think it's bad and you should be trying to avoid it, then you might make a leap here in order to avoid it. So that's, we say Rabbi Yehuda must believe that. However, we have a problem because Rabbi Yehuda says otherwise. That Tanya, but Rabbi Yehuda says in a different Brita, first we have Rabbi Shimon, sorry, then we'll have him in a second. See, it's Ben Shein, Yesh no al mitzcho, Uven Shein, Eno al mitzcho, Miratze, Diver Rabbi Shimon. The seats, which is the, um, the plate that says Kodesh Hashem that goes on the forehead of the Kohen Gadol that we read about in the Parsha a couple of weeks ago. When the Torah says that it makes, uh, it atones for Tuma of sacrifices. So Rabbi Shimon says, whether it's on the forehead of the Kohen Gadol or whether he's not wearing it, uh, either way, the existence of the tzitz causes Hashem to accept Korbanot, if they're tummy and you had to bring them anyway. Rabbi Yehuda says, Odo mitzcho miratza, ain Odo mitzcho miratza. So Rabbi Yehuda says, well, nope, as long as it's, while it's on the Kohen Gadol's forehead, it works, but it doesn't work when he's not wearing it. I'm going to look Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon says to him, Kohen Gadol biyom kipurim yochiach, she'eno al mitzcho miratza. Rabbi Shimon says, well, Rabbi Yehuda, what you say doesn't work. Because we know that on Yom Kippur, when he goes into the Holy of Holies, the Kohen Gadol does not wear any of the gold parts of his uniform. He wears an all-white cloth uniform that only ever gets worn for that. And yet we know, and so that he's not wearing the seats because it's made out of gold. And yet we know that the seats is operative and makes God accept um, Korbanot if they become Tameh, even while the Kohen Gadol is not wearing it on Yom Kippur afternoon. And Rabbi Yehuda responds, Amar lo Rabbi Yehuda, hanach Yom Kippurim she'tuma hutra b'tzibur. Rabbi Yehuda says, leave Yom Kippur aside. It doesn't, it's not relevant here because tuma is permitted in the public. Now, a minute ago, we said that he was one, he was a pushed aside kind of person, not a permitted kind of person. So Rabbi Yehuda can't hold both sides of that dispute. So we have a problem. But the Gemara is about to say we have an even bigger problem. The Lita'amecha, Tikshi Lach Higufa. The Gemara says, wait a minute. If you're trying to make Rabbi Yehuda be consistent, you have a much bigger problem, which is the Braita itself. So let's go back and look at it again. It's going to quote it. And see what the problem is. Rabbi Yehuda um, Omer Me'abrin. Rabbi Yehuda, back in our Brita, said, We do, in fact, impregnate the year because of Tuma. 
And then right away it says, And then Rabbi Yehuda said, and there's a story that Chizkiya Melch Yehuda um, impregnated the year because of Tuma, and then he did Chuva and prayed for himself. Wait a minute. If Rabbi Yehuda doesn't think that Chizkiya did anything wrong, then what does Rabbi Yehuda think Chizkiya is praying about? And why is Rabbi Yehuda even quoting this story if he thinks that it's fine to do this? There, this would make a lot more sense if Rabbi Yehuda were on the other side. So we're going to have to rewrite our Brita because our Brita is, is, has Rabbi Yehuda being internally inconsistent and also inconsistent with this position that he has elsewhere that to Mahutra Betsibor, because if he really holds that Tuma Hutra Betsibor, which is to say that if you have to offer sacrifices in the state of Tuma, because it's they're the communal sacrifices and all of the Kohanim are Tame, then that's actually just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. So in that case, why would he bother making a leap here, much less permitted? Um, by the way, this creates all kinds of problems for the Hanukkah story, but I'm going to try to stay on track. We won't go there right now, if we have time at the end. Okay, so, um, it must be that our text of the Brita we started with is lacking, and this is what it's supposed to say. The first position should say we don't, uh, we don't add a leap month because of Tuma, but if they did it, it worked. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Eina Meuberet. Vama Rabbi Yehuda Vachur. So Rabbi Yehuda says, nope, it doesn't work. And let me tell you a story about it not working. See, Chizki had tried to add a Yit month, and he ended up having to do Chuba because they had Pesach in the wrong month. Okay, so now that piece makes sense. It explains what Chizki is doing in Rabbi Yehuda's quote. We have a different problem. Ihachi, Rabbi Shimon Omer, so in that case, the next position in the Brita was Rabbi Shimon, and he said, if they did in fact uh, impregnate it because of Tuma, it worked. But wait a minute, that's the same position as the as the Tanakama, as the first time. So it's a little weird to quote two positions in the Brita that that say the same thing. That seems like we probably made a mistake about Rabbi Shimon too. Amarava lechatchila ikabenai. So Rava says now they disagree about whether you're permitted to begin with to add a uh, to add a leap month because of two. Um, so it's going to turn out that Rabbi Shimon, who we thought just said if you did it, it works, even though you're not supposed to do it. In fact, what Rabbi Shimon said was, eh, go ahead and do it. It's fine. Tanya Mihachi, and we, in fact, we have another Brita that records Rabbi Shimon's position that way. You, we, you can't uh, add a leap month because of Tuma to start with, but Rabbi Shimon Omer, but if you say you can't do it to start with, that means, but it does work if you did it. It doesn't say that explicitly, but that's usually what, what that, that wording means. Uh, Rabbi Shimon Omer Ma'abri, and Rabbi Shimon says, no, it's fine. You, we, you can add a leap month because of uh, because of Tuma. And that will now accord with Rabbi Shimon's other position back in his machloket with Rabbi Yehuda about the tzitz, where it seemed like Rabbi Shimon held Tuma dechuya b'tzibor there. He held the position that Tuma is only pushed away by the tzibor, not, not removed completely. So he's going to be a guy who's going to be very uncomfortable with the idea of doing sacrifices in Tuma even when necessary. And so he's going to be prepared to add a month to the year in order to avoid that happening. And now all of the positions fit together nicely. So now we're back to the question, though, of what Chizkiah was praying about, according to Rabbi Shimon. Because now Rabbi Shimon thinks, yeah, there's nothing wrong with making a leap month because of Tuma. So if, in fact, Chizkiah had made a leap month because of Tuma, then 
that would have been permitted and it would have worked. And so then why does the Torah describe them making Pesach in the second month, in the wrong month? And why is Chizkiya upset? That doesn't make any sense. So Chizkiya must be upset. It must be uh, doing chufa for something other than uh, creating a leap month because of tumor. And in that case, it's because she'en ma'abrin ela atar v'hu yiber nisan v'nisan. It's going to be the same thing that uh, we said before for Rabbi Yehuda ben Shimon, I think his name was, um, that if we don't, the only, the only change you can make in order to create a leap year is to make a second at the R. And that's not what he did. He tried to make a second Nisan when it was already Nisan. And that doesn't work. It doesn't matter why you do it. It doesn't work, period. So he did it, and then it didn't work. And then after Pesach, he realizes, oh, darn, the whole calendar is messed up. This wasn't really Pesach. Pesach was really a month ago. And then he does too. Uh, but now we need to address that. Amar Marsh, ein ma'abrin ela adar who iber nisan nisan. Wait a minute. You said that you can only add Adar, and he added a second Nisan. But lately, wait a minute. We have an interpretation of the Pasuk in Parshat Bo, this month is for you the first of months, which is a, a conversation that Hashem has with Moshe um, between plagues nine and 10, if I remember correctly when he first gives him the instructions for the very first Pesach. And the, uh, there is a Midrash that says, why does it say this month is for you the first month? What, what's the, this doing there? And there are many Midrashim on this word, but one of them is this one. This is Nisan and you can't have another Nisan. You only get one Nisan. So doesn't, didn't Hezekiah have that Midrash? Um, now, it might have been legitimate to say, uh, no, <laughs> that Midrash isn't that old, but we almost never do that. Um, even with rabbinic halacha, we very rarely admit that the characters in Tanakh didn't have the same rabbinic laws. Um, and certainly with an interpretation of the Torah, we're going to go way out of our way to avoid saying that. So instead, ta'abidishmul. Now, it must be, in fact, that he made a mistake about the thing that Shmuel taught. Not, he didn't think of it as the thing that Shmuel taught. Shmuel wasn't going to be born for a thousand years, but it happens to be the same thing that we quote in the name of Shmuel. The Amar Shmuel, in ma'abriyat hashana biyom shloshim shel adar, ho'il ve'ra'ui lekov ov nisan. Shmuel said, you can't make a leap year on the 30th day of adar, even though it's still adar, it's not nisan yet. But it's the 30th day of Adar, which could have been the first of Nisan. It just it happens that it's not, but it could have been. Because since it could have been the first day of Nisan, it's too late already to make another Adar. Even though it's not actually Nisan, it could have been, but that's close enough. The Ihu Savar, but Chizkiya thought, he thought we, we don't say this since it could have been a thing. Um, and then afterwards he says, oh, darn, I guess we do say since it could have been. And uh, yeah, I, that leap year that I declared didn't work because I did it a day too late. Tayin Amihachi. And the Abrita teaches similarly, This is a tangent because it's, it's just quoting the same thing that we quoted in the name of Shmuel, but in an, the name of an earlier source. But once we quoted Shmuel, we want to give the earliest possible source also. And this is the same thing. You can't um, impregnate the year on the 30th day of Adar since it could have been. Okay, coming back to our uh, new version of our Brita, Rabbi Shimon ben, that, that we, our last version polished it off with a quote from Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda. So now we need to quote him again here. Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda, Omer Mishum Rabbi Shimon, Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda said in the name of Rabbi Shimon that what was wrong in the time of Chizkiah was that he had all of 
the Jews or most of the Jews had the Jews do Pesach Sheni instead of Pesach. Okay, so according to this position, there's no calendar manipulation at all. Pesach happens when it's supposed to happen. Presumably it's even celebrated by some small cohort of people in Yerushalayim, but then the main crowd of people is deferred to the second Pesach. So, hey, so what, what, what happened? Amar of Ashi, Kigon Shahayu Yisrael Mechzat Me'im Mechzat Tehorim, Venashim Mashlimot Tehorim Ve'od Fodaleha. So Rav Ashi said, it, it has to go like this. Most of the men of Yisrael were, sorry, the men of Yisrael were half and half, half Tame, half Tahor. Exactly half and half, it sounds like. Vinashim, and, but the women were more than half Tahor. Maybe they're all Tahor, I don't know. But if you count men and women together, you have a majority of Tahor. If you count just men, then you have either 50-50 Tahor Tame or maybe even a majority Tame. Not clear. And Chizkiyo is trying to figure out, uh, well, how am I supposed to count this? Meikara Savar Nashim Berishon Chova. So originally, um, originally Chizkiyo thought that women on first Pesach are obligated to bring the Pesach. In which case they count toward our count because they're part of the group of people who are obligated to first Pesach. And then we would have a majority of people who are Tahor. Um, and if the majority had been Tame, we would just do Pesach in Tuma and everybody could just come anyway. But if it's a minority of people who are Tame, then we tell the Tame people, go away, come back in a month. So if you count the, he, originally he counted the women and that got him a majority that was Tahor now. We do a normal Pesach now and the people who are Tame now go home, get tame, Tahor and come back again. Um, okay, but then in the end, Savar Nashim Berishon Rashut. And he changed his mind and he decided that women's bringing the Korban Pesach at regular Pesach, at first Pesach, is optional, so they shouldn't count. So he had made the wrong decision before. The Havaluhu Tmeim Ruba, because it turned, turned out instead that the majority of the people who were obligated in Korban Pesach had been Tameh. And a major, if the majority is Tameh, then you don't tell them to come back Pesach Sheni. You just let them come now and do it Tameh. And so this is why he's doing chuba is because it turns out that he made the wrong decision. Um, and he should have had them come and do regular Pesach, but, and he should not have sent out this announcement that everyone should come in the second month instead. Okay, <laughs> are there questions? So is that how Pesach Sheni works, where you really have to figure out who, who's in the majority and, and who isn't from, from B'nai Israel? Yes, but my guess is that most of the time it's not close. Um, right? if, if, yeah. the, if Mashiach comes tomorrow and we're trying to make Pesach in a month and a half, in Yerushalayim and nobody's Tahor yet, then we'll just all be Tum, right? On the other hand, a year later, having found and manufactured somehow the ashes of the Para Aduma and gotten our act together as a people and learned how to do this correctly, we should be down to us minority again. And my guess would be that in a normal year, it's always a minority. It's just that, right? Right. right. You would think so. As a as a thought experiment, you can imagine an even balance, and you know it might even happen sometimes if there's a very prominent funeral or something right before. But 
my guess would be that 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 would be it, usually, usually the numbers are are dramatically one way or the other and it, it, you don't have to do this kind of arithmetic. Um, and why was it that women's status was unknown at that time? So I mean there's still a machloket about it in the Gemara and imagining that machlokot that existed in the rabbinic time are extremely old is not an especially unusual interpretive technique. Mm -hmm. We see that a bunch. And in fact, it's not a particularly surprising interpretive technique. Uh, it, it, you and I, when we read the Gemara also sometimes say, oh, well, these two guys are arguing about the same thing that I was arguing about with my friend yesterday. That's yeah, not, and the time difference is much greater between us and the Gemara than it is between the Gemara and Hizkiah. Right. So it's not terribly surprising. True, that's true. Um, okay, thank you. I will see you guys all next Monday. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Thank okay. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.